Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and it shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever joyous in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe. St. Joseph. St. Ace de Loyola. St. John Vianney. Padre Pio. All God's angels and saints. Good evening. Okay, the, this evening we're going to be talking about the importance in the exercises of making what's called a general confession. Okay? So that's going to be my lecture tonight. Now, those who have already made their general confession utilize this uh, the conference to try to upgrade your confessions. Because the two most important things we can do in our lives as Catholics obviously are receiving Holy Communion and going to confession. So try to remember that, no? The two most important things you can do in your life as Catholics are going to communion and receiving confession. As a theologian, for me it's a no-brainer, but 99% um, of the Catholics don't understand that. So I'm saying it now. The two most important things you can do in your life are going to communion and going to confession. Okay, a little bit of basic theology now. I'd like to go through the steps to make a good confession. Every time we receive a sacrament, we have an encounter with Christ. Okay, so the sacraments are a direct encounter with Christ. However, the graces are of the sacrament are in direct proportion to the disposition of the individual soul. Okay? I repeat. The graces received from the sacrament are commensurate with or in direct proportion to the disposition of the individual soul. What does that mean? You can make a bad confession. And people do. They make bad confessions. So they leave the confessional worse than when they enter. People make bad confessions. You can make a mediocre confession. Okay? Mediocre. No? You can make, okay, a good confession. Then you can make an excellent confession. So the gamut is almost infinite between the bad confession and the confession of a, of a Saint Ignatius of Yola, okay? We want to we wanna aim for the heights, okay? We want to aim for the stars, okay? You're, you should, every confession, you should try to make it better than the confession before. That should be, that should be your, your, uh, your desire. Every confession you make will be better than the confession you made before that. That should be a Lenten proposal. Yeah. A Lenten proposal. That being said, the, the better preparation you have, the more abundant the graces. So when you receive communion, receive it as if it were your first your last and your only. When you go to confession, receive it as if it were your first, your last, and your only. Those who are doing the exercise as well probably feel that there's a certain crescendo where you're being led step by step to want to make a good confession. Because you meditate upon, what? The purpose of your existence, right? Principle and foundation. Then you meditate upon the sin of the angels. Then you meditate upon the last things. Death, judgment, heaven and hell, imbued with the whole concept of eternity. 
And last week you meditated upon the capital sins, right? Gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, <laughs> anger, envy, pride. I think we're all probably kind of like a ripe, a ripe pear ready to fall into the confessional. Okay? That's the dynamic of these exercises that we're we're um, preparing ourselves to encounter this merciful encounter with the Lord. So let's talk about that. When we talk about general confession, we're not talking about generic or abstruse or nebulous, or vague. Okay? That's the word general, I'll give you a Roger's thesaurus of that word, okay? But rather than we talk about general, we're talking about a confession of your whole life. You hear me? A confession of your whole life. Okay, some have already done it, uh, because we have some repeaters here, others have not. Now the newcomers, and we got probably a good 50% of you, you should make it, and I'll tell you the reason, I'll, get, I'll tell you some of the reasons why. First is St. Ignatius says you should do it, so that's good enough for me. Okay? <laughs> He's, uh, he's the saint, and we want to follow the advice and the footsteps of the saints. Second, by making a gender confession, you will arrive at greater humility. What? Yes. <laughs> okay. You're going to grow in humility. And we all want to grow in that virtue of humility. You're not going to become a saint if you don't strive to grow in humility. Third is going to be growing in self-knowledge. Okay? What is the axiom of the Desert Fathers? The two-word imperative, know thyself, okay? And the Greek philosophers say, a life that is not examined is a life that's not worth living, right? And the famous historian says, he who does not know history is condemned to repeat the same errors. Right? Yes. Okay, let's give you let me give you another reason. There are some sins that we commit that are very embarrassing. They cause a lot of shame. And if it is such that we have held back those sins because of shame or fear or embarrassment, the mortal sin, that means that you're, you know, you've made a bad confession or bad confessions. And if you make bad confessions, how are your communions? What's that? Yeah, they're sacrilegious, no? Because there's an intimate connection between the sacramental life. If you make bad confessions, then you're going to be receiving bad communions. So given that there's been, uh, since Vatican II, as a whole, very poor catechesis, almost across the board, but especially on the sacrament of confession, now you've got your golden opportunity to make the best confession in your life. Amen? Amen? Now you have the golden opportunity to make the best confession in your life. Because there are sins that are very embarrassing. They are. Maybe you know, you gave in to a homosexual act or masturbation or pornography 
or maybe you got drunk, or maybe maybe you stole money from someone. I mean, let's be honest, it's embarrassing. And it can happen at times that the embarrass, embarrassment can, can paralyze us. No? We're filled with so much fear that we, we don't get it out. No? Okay, let me take one more step. It's true, uh, no doubt about it, that the church is going through the most difficult time in the history of the country in the United States. That's a no-brainer, right? We've never gone through more difficult times as we're going through right now. Hopefully we'll be able to get through it. No? And there's been problems, you know, in the priesthood, and all of you, I don't have to talk about that, but I think in the, as a whole, in the married life, it's much worse than in the priesthood, if I can be honest with you. <laughs> Maybe one out of ten priests fall, might be, but, but six out of ten marriages fall apart. So that's huge, isn't it? And you know what I'm talking about. So the man in the marital said he said probably five times worse than the priesthood, no? Why? I know you're gonna say the cultural the cultural milieu, eh, partially. But I'm talking as a priest. I think a lot of couples are not properly prepared. If you don't come to this parish, you, your preparation is, Mike, it's a four-hour mini-retreat some Saturday, right? Yeah. Right? There's going to be, you know, spotting out a few pies platitudes and, you know, they're getting balloons yeah. and teddy bears and you're ready to get married, no? Or maybe Bozo the Clown, something like that, you know? I don't think that's enough to get married. It took me seven years, no? Four years before, you know, getting a degree in English Lit from Villanova, so 11 years, that's a, that's a long haul, isn't it, no? So let's, uh, let's, uh, let, 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 let's, let, let's drop the bomb now, okay? How many couples before they get married make an excellent confession. <laughs> I think you're pretty optimistic. No? Yeah. <laughs> what do most couples do before they get married? Okay, What are they doing the week before they get married? Are they thinking about visitors that are coming in from, from Manila? Maybe from La Ciudad de Mexico, or going to Chilangos, or maybe. In other words, you, you're, you're worrying about uh, the hospitality, which you should. Then you're worrying also about um, these, these items that are of transcendental importance. What type of cake you're going to have on uh, your, uh, your wedding day. Is it going to be devil food's cake or angel cake, or is it going to be? <laughs> is the rug going to be red or is it going to be beige? No. How long is your veil going to be? Twelve inches or fourteen and a half? Oh, those are such important topics. <laughs> then are you going to throw rice or you know the modern Franciscan sp spirituality bubble stuff? They're trying to do that now to save money, huh? I know, I'm sarcastic at times, am I not? <laughs> but what I'm heading at, usually a bit of sarcasm, is the last thing they're thinking about is the sacrament. And that probably happened to all of you, no? Yes. Just that, right? As you, know, you were brought up in, in that, this type of society. Uh, now, that being the case. You didn't make the confessional. Maybe you had not been to confession for a year. 
in that year, well, he missed mass once a month. With any good, without any good reasons. And then you fell into fornication that year, your courtship, well, twice a month. So two times 12, 24. You miss mass maybe 10 times. Maybe you looked at pornography and you got drunk a few times. Maybe you got 50 mortal sins. On the day of your marriage, you go through the ceremony, receive communion with 50 mortal sins on your soul. The only priest I've ever heard preach this is Father Broom, yours truly. <laughs> and it's like having an elephant in your bathroom. There's an elephant in my bathroom? I don't think so. Okay, let's, uh, let's use a little bit of logic and theology. So they're married, and ever since that day, they really don't get along well together. They're quarreling, they're bickering, they're not at peace. First kid is born, they're arguing even more. The second kid is born, and things are getting worse and worse. And then there's a huge argument, a blowout, back to mom's house. The sacramental grace of marriage was never operative in their life. But they kept receiving communion, too. So my theological uh, assertion to this highly educated group that I have before my eyes is this. I think a lot of marriages fall apart for, for the exact reason that I've just explained right now. Go ahead and shoot out some social cliches and this and that, and I'll try to rationalize or justify it, but Fulton Sheen, you've heard of him? He says it takes three to get married. You've never had Christ in the marriage. How's it going to work? Right? For that reason, anyone who comes to the parish to get married here, they've got to pass through me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not going to marry you unless you go to confession. It's as simple as that. I'm going to give you a couple to prepare you well to make the confession. You're going to go to confession. Otherwise, no marriage. Amen? Amen. So, it, it, it could be here that... I mean, it could be here that maybe you fall into that category. No? And uh, listen, you've you got to be dead honest. Don't beat around the bush. If that's the case, go to confession, okay? You're going to be absolved, and you're going to start a new life. You meditate upon the last things, right? Death, judgment, heaven and hell, right? Purgatory, eternity. I honestly, I, I, I tremble in my boots about thinking of going before Jesus with unconfessed sin. Oh, God save me. I repeat, I tremble in my boots, if I had boots on, I, <laughs> to think about going before Jesus and the day of judgment with unconfessed serious sin. Uh, I, I, you're gonna be, we're going to be lost. So I think that this program is a, ma is a masterpiece, this program, not because I wrote it. Okay? <laughs> but for that one idea, if I can help all of you to make the best confession in your life, that's worth more than all the money in the world. Amen? Amen? If I can help any of you to make the best confession in your life, 
get you back in the state of grace. Have you ever heard of Thomas Aquinas? He says, one person that goes in the confessional and comes out making good confession, that is greater than the whole created universe. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor. All the greatest miracles, natural miracles in the world, cannot be compared to one person going from the state of mortal sin to the state of grace. Aquinas is great, isn't he? I love Thomas Aquinas. What a, what a thinker, huh? So moving from, from sin to the state of grace is, is greater than all the miracles in the world on a natural plane. Now, if it is such that, okay, you know, you went to confession a day before you, you made your wedding, you made the best confession in the world, okay, fine. But that's the exception to the rule. Usually not the case. But even those who are not married, we've got to be honest, there are certain sins that are very embarrassing. <laughs> and it's sometimes difficult to get it out. Just for your information, um, we as priests were trained, remember as a deacon, about 34, 35 years ago, they taught us in Rome, no? You should never, never, never express surprise on whatever you hear. And remember the case that they gave you. If your best friend killed your mother, you shouldn't be surprised about that. I remember that one well. Well, that was the, the case example they gave us. No? Your best friend kills your mother. Well. Should be a shock, but that even that shouldn't shock you. Because without the as Teresa of Avila says, without without the state of grace, we shouldn't be surprised what we do, we should be surprised what we don't do. Teresa of Avila, you've heard of her, right? In other words, without the, without the grace, we could do the most horrendous things in the world. You believe me? Let me mention to you six Catholics. John Paul II, Mother Teresa, John Bosco, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Fidel Castro. <coughs> Do you have those six saints on your bathroom wall? I hope you only have three of them, okay? <laughs> Castro was formed by the Jesuits. His brother Raoul was too, right? <coughs> Hitler was not German. He was an Austrian. Stalin was a, was, was a Russian Orthodox, right? So we're capable of doing the most monstrous things without God's grace. But with God's grace, we can become great saints. That's why we're here, right? So uh, that's kind of a long-winded intro, trying to convince us the importance of it. Let me give you the brass tacks and how you can make it, okay? So the, you're preparing yourself to make a general confession. You have to beg for the grace to make it well. Beg for the grace. As you get older, scared one person away. Okay, okay. As you get older, and and you you grow in your spiritual life, you're going to recognize what Saint Augustine says. All that we do is sheer grace. And I'm becoming more and more aware that if I can do something good, <laughs> it's not Father Broom. It's the grace of God. Did you learn this at Steubenville? Prevenient grace. Before any good action, 
you have a grace that precedes it. You just say yes to it. It's called prevenient grace. The grace that precedes the good action. So it's, it's God's doing. You just have to say yes to it. Huh? Prevenient grace. Okay. So you want to give yourself... You want to give yourself a block of time in which... You're alone with God to examine your conscience. Okay, most people would require uh, give yourself four to five hours, okay? Some people prepare a couple of days, no? Right? Did you make a genetic confession, Alphonse? How, how long did it take? Well, it took him a week. No? Yeah, week Great. A week and a half? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, no, I, I really, my, did, did it help the confession? Yes. Life changing? Yes. Zero. A couple of people here that they've said that their life was tra radically transformed, but they, you know, calmly they took, uh, they, they took time, no? So you don't want to you don't want to be ru rushing through this. You want to prepare yourself calmly. Okay. okay. Most of you most of you maybe won't take that long, but give yourself a, a good morning or a good afternoon, a good block of time which you're not going to be disturbed. Because if you're disturbed, then the flow of grace is uh, it's thwarted. Okay. The grace of God flows like a stream. But if we put a blockade there, it's, it's going to be blocked. What often happens, Ignatius says, is, is that you're starting to examine your life. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit gives you a movie in which you're kind of reliving the movie of your life. The good as well as the, the bad things. But if you're being disturbed by noise and radio, whatever, whatever it might be, then that's, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be blocked. To find a, a quiet place. And then before the confession, pray to the Holy Spirit and pray to Mary. Then, go through the classical traditional steps that we learned back in the 50s and 60s. We have too many young people here, okay? <laughs> but uh, I caught the tail end of the Baltimore Catechism, which is probably the best local catechism in the, in the world, both local catechism. And those nuns there, the Dominican nuns in New York, they taught us well. Here are the five steps. I'll say them all at once and I'll spend a few minutes on each one. First is examination of conscience. Second is okay, sorrow for your sins. Third is firm purpose of amendment. Fourth is confessing your sins to the priest who represents Christ. Okay, the fifth is to carry out your penance. I would strongly exhort all of you to memorize those five steps. And every time you go to confession, see if you're going through those five steps. Examination of conscience. Sorrow for sin. Firm purpose of amendment. Confess your sins to the priest that represents Christ. And finally, carry out the penance. If you carry that out, you have made a good sacramental confession 
You have been forgiven by Christ. The blood of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, has washed you clean. Isaiah chapter 1, though your sins be like scarlet, they'll become white as the snow. Amen? Amen. So let's just give, give just a couple minutes on each of those steps, and then I'll, I'll leave you in good hands. Examination of conscience. Okay, you're going to be doing that. Here is uh, the little booklet. I mentioned this in passing that I, I've written another examination, which is, I think, is much better. I'm not tooting the horn, but it's much better, but it doesn't have the imprimatur yet. And I don't, being a religious, I don't do anything if it's not, not under obedience, okay? But this is pretty good. But mine is much more modern, taking into, into account the modern social media world in which we live. No? One day, I, I hope and pray that my, my book will be published in Spanish and English. No? What? It will. Well, I, I hope. I, 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 I rely upon your prayers. No? Yes. I, I really I believe that, I, I, that if that's published, it, it's going to do a lot of good. No? I used it in private practice about, what, seven years ago, but I uh, have to get it, I want to get it approved by the, get the imprimatur. No? But this is, this is good. The Father, Father Altier from Minnesota, pretty good. So you're going to be examining your conscience on the Ten Commandments. Okay? The book is good. Just go through it categorically. We would encourage you th this time around because um, I'm going to ask for your I'm going to ask for your prayers because one of the problems is this, and I can be honest with you, uh, there's a shortage of priests. Uh, there's a shortage of priests, so it's it, we're we're struggling to find enough priests. Because in Spanish and English, right now, we've got 700 people doing the exercises. That's a lot. Last year, we went into Yorba Linda. We had 400 people. Last year, we had about 1,200 people doing the exercises. And they had to fly in a, a, a religious priest from Arizona to help us out. because. <laughs> so uh, I... I feel uh, a, heavy, a heavy burden on my shoulders right now uh, because, um, because I, I, we're, we're trying to get priests, we're trying to get hours, and it's, Lent is a very difficult time. It's a good problem, uh, but it's, uh, it's difficult because of the, the shortage of priests. It might be in 10 or 15 years, a priest is going to be a rare commodity. You're not going to be seeing priests. I hope not. It's going to be like a precious jewel to be able to see a priest and go to confession. You know, you might have to wait, maybe wait 10 days to be able to do that. As of now, uh, that's not the case. Especially in this parish. Okay? Most parishes, they confess one hour a week, and that's it. You probably know that, right? Saturday, what, 4.30 to 5.15, and then it's over. Whereas in this parish, we try to be available. Usually, I confess three hours every day. More. What? More. Yeah, well, Saturdays were usually, last Saturday, I was there nine hours, okay? <coughs> that was our, it was our retreat, no? I had no problem going to sleep that night, I tell you, man. <laughs> I'm in my mid 60s too, so I'm not a young whippersnapper anymore, no? <laughs> but I've decided as a priest that I'm, I'm trying to dedicate myself to two missions. I'm trying to preach as much as I can TV, radio, writing books, writing articles. I've been trying to preach the Word of God as much as I can. Because people do not receive the sacrament if they don't understand the sacraments. 
right? And second, I just try to spend almost all the free time I have in the confessional. So those are the two things that basically, you know, you people that know me, you see me there, right? Either I'm preaching here, like today I started my afternoon at 2 o'clock doing a funeral mass for a miscarriage baby. Then 3.30, I had a hundred parents for catechism. Then I had the confirmation kids. Then I had a 6.15 mass. Now I'm with you, so basically from 2 o'clock to 8.30, it's non-stop talking. Any teachers here? It's the most demanding thing, right? If you do it well. You know, you're, you're teaching in front of a class for six, seven, eight hours nonstop. It's exhausting if you, if you take it seriously, right? Right, Brianna? You're, you're a rookie, but you're you know, learning the ropes, right? <laughs> but I'm not, what I'm saying is pr pray that we get more priests. Do any of you have any, do any, of you have any sons? Do you? Yes. Pray that maybe they will become a priest. Well, no, look, don't do that. Uh, the fact that you're saying no, that, the fact you're saying no, maybe God is calling you in that direction. Because no? the harvest is rich. I do all I can to try to promote. If you have a vocation, if you don't, if you don't kid yourself, but if God calls you, God will give you the grace. Okay? God will give you the grace. Look, I'm not worthy to pre be a priest. Are you kidding? God, God qualifies the unqualified if you say yes. Amen? Yeah. Amen. None of us are worthy. But God calls. And we have to say yes. Amen or oh me? Uh, he's, <laughs> he's saying oh me. <laughs> Yeah, who knows, maybe 15 years he'll be an oblate priest and he'll be pushing me around in a wheelchair, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, when you're going to confession also, make sure that you write down your sins. Are you writing that down now? <laughs> write down your sins. So otherwise, you're probably going to forget some of the sins. And you come out of the country, ah, I forgot the most important thing. Let me get back there. Ah, pal, hit the line. <laughs> so write them down. We all have memory blanks, right? Probably heard the story of the, of the husband that was having memory problems, and the wife bought him some memory pills, but he always forgot to take them, right? <laughs> So the second step is sorrow for sin. We've got to be sorry for our sins. How can we, arrive at, how, how can we elicit that sorrow? We've got to beg for the grace. But contemplating Jesus on the cross is a good way to elicit true sorrow for our sins. It's a grace. Now, there are two types of sorrow, called attrition and contrition. Attrition and contrition. You know what that is, attrition and contrition? I don't know. I didn't think so, so I was going to tell you, okay? I wanted to make sure I clarified that for you. Attrition is this. You're sorry for your mortal sins because if you don't repent of them, you could go to hell. That's good enough to make a good confession. A lot of people will downplay what is called fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as your friend Aquinas says, the greatest gift is wisdom which perfects charity. But the first one in operation is fear of the Lord. In operation. 
So all, uh, all of you, all of us should have fear of the Lord. About 33 years ago, when I arrived in Argentina and I started to read Spanish, Spanish Gallega from Spain, I was reading some of uh, Teresa of Avila. And you know what hit me most in her writings? You'd, almost every page, you, you'd see these words pop up. Su majestad y temor de Dios. Habla español? Su majestad, know what that is? Your majesty in temor de Dios. Fear of the Lord. This is Teresa of Avila now. Your majesty, calling God king. Your majesty in temor, temor de Dios. Fear of the Lord. But you want to go beyond fear of the Lord. Perfect contrition is you don't want to sin because you recognize how much God loves you and how much he wants you to love him back. Yeah. You got that? How much God loves you, but how much he wants you to love him back. You read, you know, classic literature like Shakespeare or some of the big writers. One of the greatest, most common themes is love that is frustrated. Okay, love that is not returned. Okay, and they say that person died of a broken heart. It's true. So I've given a definition. Sin is not simply breaking a commandment, but breaking the heart of God. Not simply breaking a commandment, but breaking the heart of God. We have commandments. Right, right? But as, even as I get older as a priest, I'm recognizing more and more the commandments are so important. But basically, our Catholic religion is a love affair. It's a love affair. God loves us so much that he sent his son to be nailed on the cross because he loves us so much. If that doesn't move us, nothing's going to move us. So we don't want to sin because God loves us so much. And love demands a response of love. You know, one of the greatest sufferings of parents is you love your children so much and they don't return that love. Right? It's so common today. You've loved them to death and they're indifferent to you now. I think some parents have experienced And that's painful, isn't it? That's why you're here. You're making the exercises for the salvation of your children too, right? Amen? Amen. Yeah. But if we arrive at that, I don't want to sin because I love God. I don't want to do anything to jeopardize my love relationship with God. The greatest Spanish poet was St. John of the Cross. In el ocaso de nuestra existencia, seremos juzgados sobre el amor. The greatest Spanish poet for you. Huh? <laughs> Translation in English, in the twilight of our existence, we'll be judged on love. St. John of the Cross. What does St. Francis de Sales say? The measure by which we should love God is to love him without measure. St. Francis de Sales, yeah. So, see your, your confession is, you're drawn close to the greatest, your best friend and your greatest lover, Jesus Christ. He's going to forgive you 
and he wants to enter in, into a profound, loving relationship with you until you get to heaven. Amen? Third step. Firm purpose of amendment. If you have the habit of going to confession uh, with a certain frequency, this is probably where you're weakest. Okay? Yes. What? Yes. You agree with that? Yes. It's probably where we're weakest. So the firm purpose of amendment means this. You have to avoid any person, place, thing, or a circumstance that leads you into sin. I repeat, you have to avoid any person, place, thing, or circumstance that leads you into sin. He who plays with fire is going to get burnt, right? You're from the East Coast, he who walks on thin ice is going to fall through. Happened to me more than once. Being a New Yorker. He who walks on a slippery slope is going to fall. What does the Old Testament teach? He who plays in danger will perish in danger. So you have to step back and look. When you fell into sin, what preceded that falling into sin? Self-knowledge. So I repeat, when you fell into sin, you fell. But well, there was something that led you into it. So this, it demands that you have to kind of rewind the film of your life to see where were you at when you fell in sin? What was happening before in your heart? This demands a lot of humility and a lot of courage. Yeah. A lot of humility, but you've got to be courageous too. I think one of the most difficult things to do is to look in the mirror of your own soul and see who you are. Self-knowledge can be darn painful at times. But without self-knowledge, we're never going to advance in our spiritual life. I could go on expounding upon this until midnight, but let me, let me just give you one idea. And I could give you case examples, but listen. By now... All of you know, uh, mo you, all, you, you know already 11 of the rules for discernment. We've gone through most of them. Okay, this is a universal concept now from St. Ignatius. Okay, when you are in desolation, that's when the devil is going to tempt you. You hear me? When you're in desolation, that's when the devil goes after you. That's universal. It doesn't matter where we're at. I repeat, when we're in desolation, the, the, the devil sees we're in that state, and he goes after us, and he goes after our kryptonite. Goes after our weakness. I'm going to give you a very clear example a little bit delicate, but this it's a no-brainer for me. And I made a reference to this last week. Many men, state of desolation, the temptation to give in to pornography is very rampant. Millions. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're aware of that right now, if you, can, if you can leave this course just with that one idea, that can save your soul. That one idea. Remember that one idea from Father Broome. So what happens? Okay, you're in desolation. The devil tempts you in that area. Aja de contra. You've you got to go in the other direction. you got to. So instead of succumbing to that, what you know is wrong, have recourse to God. Say your rosary. Make your holy hour. Go to Mass. 
then go out with a friend and play tennis. Or go to one of those elegant restaurants in Southern California, go to Pollo Loco. Okay? <laughs> See, because there you're, you're in desolation. In, in the past five years, you know, I've been weak. I've been, I've been running to that false god. That's what it is. I've done the exercises. I'm in desolation. I'm not going to go there. I made a determined decision. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go. I'm going to run to God. I'm going to seek my refuge in the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. Then I'm going to distract myself with some wholesome activity. Some wholesome, wholesome activity. So that's the third step. You understand? You following me? Because it's a real art to confess well. But you have to have teaching on it. And you have to try to put, implement what I'm trying to teach you. As I said, the two most important things you can do in your life is to go to confession and to go to communion. Amen? Yeah. Fourth step is this. You haven't arrived at the confessional yet. Now you've arrived, okay? St. Faustina Kowalsk in the diary recounts that on one occasion she went to confession and she came out of the confessional in tranquil, not at peace. And Jesus appeared to her and she said, why did I not experience peace before confessing? And Jesus said, because you forgot to pray for the priest before you went in the confessional. Do you know that we have a guardian angel? Do you have one? Let them work together. Work out. So you send your guardian angel with mine. Help me. Let the guardian angel work. A plus. The guardian angels, they work. And very few Catholics take advantage of their guardian angels to help us. They give us light. A lot of peace. A lot of strength. Yeah, it's true. But then when you go in the confessional, you finally arrived, we're going to try to help you to, to get your confession done as soon as possible. Uh, pray for us. We'll be able to get the right, you know, we'll get enough praise to get it done. We're going to try to get it done as, prepare it as best as possible. We're working on that now, right, Mary? Yeah. Is this. Okay, don't laugh at me. Well, you can if you want. You can laugh at me. <laughs> when you enter the confession, you'll close the door. You can laugh at that if you want. Okay? <laughs> Why? Because a lot of people, they leave the door open. No? Then when they leave, then they slam the door shut. Right? <laughs> so it should be the other way around, right? Yes. If the door is open, people might be, might be listening to your sin. Okay? And I'm sure you don't want that, do you? No. Then... Let's go back to the classical way of how, how we learn how to confess. The younger generation, they don't know, but so I'm going to teach you what's very important when you confess. You can either go behind the screen, you can go face to face, that's up to you. Okay? But start off by the sign of the cross. You start off, not the priest, you start off. And then say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was a month ago. These are my sins. This is my first general confession. Excellent. Excellent. You have cast me into consolation. Right? That, 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 that helps out so much. It helps out so much. Uh, my parents, their first two children, are doctors. 
One is a soul surgeon, another is orthopedic surgeon, okay? okay. Hit the jackpot, huh? <laughs> one for the body, the other one for the soul, no? So if you were to go to Michael Broom in Orlando to have your back checked, one of the first things he's going to ask you is, well, when was the last time you had, you had your back checked? Well, what about the x-rays? And you say, well, it was about 48 hours ago. He said, it was about 48 years ago. There's a big difference, right? So myself, not being a back surgeon, but a soul surgeon, if you give me the time, that helps out. There's a big difference between one month and 48 years, right? Yeah. Then you confess. Now, now, this is canon law as well as the catechism of the Catholic Church. You have to tell them the number and species of mortal sins. You hear that? The number and species, of mo number and types of mortal sins. Okay, type would be this. Okay, so in the sixth and ninth commandment, is there a difference between fornication and, adult and adultery? Hello? Is one worse than the other? Yes. Hello? Yes. yes? Adultery, you, you, it's a sac didn't you promise to be faithful to your spouse? So that's a sacrilege. Fornication <laughs> premarital, they're, they're both mortal sins. And what happened, do you know what double adultery is? Mm -mm. Okay, both are married you're committing adultery with another married person makes it worse. Aquinas says the more you damage charity, the more serious the sin. You both have four kids, so so that's more serious than premarital sex. That's why species and number, you know, you until the, the type of sin that you commit against the sixth and ninth commandment. And you have to tell the number. So here you are before you're getting married, okay, you're, and the father went to confession a year ago, I had premarital sex and I missed mass. Okay, okay. Just one time? No. Well, how many times? I don't know. Well, think about it, no? Well, a couple of times a week for the past year, right? Can be what? 108 times, right? Miss Mass on Sunday, yeah, miss a few times. Well, how many times? Well, a couple of times a month for the year. You got about 26 times. So this is the catechism of the Catholic Church and Canon Law is um, you want to try to be as exact as possible. Well, some are going to say that's going to be impossible. How can they possibly arrive at the exact number? Okay, you may not be a mathematician, but the Holy Spirit is. Okay. You'd be surprised if you ask the Holy Spirit, <laughs> he's going to be honing in there, and he's going to be shining, right? Yes. He's going to be shining his light, and you, you, you might hit the number on the head, maybe you're going to be off a couple of times. But you've got to do your part, and the Holy Spirit is going to enlighten you to see the number of times. If you were to go in to get an operation breast cancer, <coughs> seven hour operation. You wake up and you see the doctor, surgeon looking in you. What's the first thing you're going to ask him? What? Did you get it all? Did you get it all, right? The doctor says, oh, about 50% of it. <laughs> the doctor comes and says, I had two of the, three of the best surgeons in LA. We got all of it. Got it all. How are you going to feel? When you go to confession, the priest is the sole surgeon. Get it all out. Get it all out. 
<laughs> and your soul be white as the snow. St. Faustina says there are three conditions that you should have when you confess. Three virtues. Transparency, humility, and obedience. You hear me? Yes. Transparency, humility, and obedience. Transparent. Try to be concise and clear as possible. Transparency is a sign of the good spirit. Blurriness, confusion is a sign of the bad spirit. Okay. Humility. Confess your own sins and not the sins of your husband, your wife, or your mother-in-law, okay? You remember Dragnet with Joe Friday? Mm -hmm. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. Remember that? <laughs> Just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. <laughs> the facts. <laughs> then obedience. The priest says, okay, why don't you say eight Hail Marys? How about four, Father? <laughs> Arm wrestling. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, two rosaries. <laughs> you have to learn how to obey. And then you say you're at the contrition. Do you know it? You don't? You can read it. And then the priest gives you absolution. He says, I absolve you of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I did not give you a general absolution. <laughs> Thought I was going to give a freebie, no? <laughs> One thing is lacking. Carry out your penance. Okay, I'm going to end with uh, a very, very consoling um, truth. Are you listening? Yes. Yes. I'd like to end on a very, very positive note. Is that God has, God has a great love for all of you. He loves you more than you're aware of. And he wants all of you this Lent to have the best Lent in your life. That's why we're here. And one way by, you, by, by which you can experience this is by means of a story I heard on Relevant Radio from Father Matthew about a year ago. Now I'd like to use a story and I'll explain what you can receive. Father Matthew tells a story about a convent of nuns, uh, active nuns, uh, very good nuns. Uh, one of the nuns, however, is kind of a, an average nun, not a Faustina, Teresa of Avila, or St. Bernadette, no, or kind of like an average nun. Okay? Not, not really that good, and not really that bad, kind of like a middle of the road nun, okay? And she, she dies, and Jesus appears to Mother Superior, and Mother Superior says, Well, wh where is that nun that died? And Jesus said, That nun? She died, she went right to heaven. And the mother said, Peter said, well, how did she, how, why? <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus said, because she took advantage of what, what the church offers. I love that story. I love that story. Now, Father Matthew did not I didn't hear him follow up explaining it, but what he was really saying is this. The church has a treasury. 
In that treasury, you have graces. In those graces, you have what are called indulgences, and you have what is called a plenary indulgence. If you receive a plenary indulgence, you receive that, all of your sins are forgiven, and the temporal punishment due to the sins are washed away. It's like being baptized again. I want all of you to receive that. But there are five conditions. You listening? Number one, you make your confession. Try to really make a good confession. Amen? Really good confession. Number two, there are indulgence acts that you carry out to receive the plenary indulgence. I'll mention one. Praying the rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Or in your family. Or the way of the cross. Or meditating upon the, the Bible an hour that you're all doing your holy hour. What I like to say is that the rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament, whether or not it's exposed or not, You then, okay, that, then, okay, confession, your rosary in front of the blessed, then you go, then you, after the rosary, you pray for the Pope and his intentions. That's important. That's one, our Father, Hail Mary, glory be. The intention of the Holy Father. The third is, let's see, confession, Mass, Rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament. That's three. Okay, the, then the fourth is this. You go to Mass and receive communion. A really fervent communion. Then the fifth is this. Reject sin. You've decided you want to reject sin in your life. If you carry out those five condi conditions, you have received a plenary indulgence and if you die, you go right to heaven without any purgatory. You like that? Yes. Hello? Yes. Does that give you consolation? So I want all of you to do that. All of you can do that, and it's going to be the best Lent in your life. You're going to be born again, rise to new life by the love of Christ. Amen. So I'm going to be starting tomorrow to offer a secondary intention, a novena, secondary intention, master, for all of you that you'll make the best confession in your life. So ask the Blessed Mother to help us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, blessed of the Lord of Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in this now and in the Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Saint Nicholas Leola, pray for you.